Can people give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? In any of our medium? Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah, my, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My, uh, wife was, uh, sitting in this chair delivering her lecture to the first year medical students a couple hours ago, and she doesn't like my nice new fancy mic, so, you know, that's what happens. Okay, so we're all good. The camera is rolling, and we have a fine set of people who have decided to dedicate 50 minutes of their lives to hearing all about Gaia data. Good afternoon, one and all. I uh, figure I should uh, start things off. Um, for the holiday season, I received a Joka Day calendar, and so I thought that I would share with you uh, this uh, wonderful uh, anecdote, which is, how does a scientist freshen her breath? The answer is with experiments, because, yeah, it's hilarious. Anyways, at least it is to me. I, my wife had a child, and then suddenly my complete sense of humor changed. I became completely uncool, I uh, had an urge to drive minivans, and, well, yeah, here we are. Uh, anyways, welcome to Dad Jokes. And today we're talking about hands-on with Gaia data. So as you may recall from the introductory video, uh, on Fridays in this class, i.e. today, we're not going to be sort of doing the fire hose of content about galactic astrophysics, but instead we're going to be working with some of the tools that researchers use for their astronomical uh, explorations to give you a sense of where these results actually come from. And today is the introduction to that. Um, I had asked you uh, in the Discord to go ahead and see if you could try to get some software installed beforehand, uh, but as we go, uh, if you want to get that Glue software installed, uh, you can give it a try. Uh, post any questions that you have in the Glue Help channel on the Discord. Uh, before I get going, um, I'll note a couple things. Uh, I've taken the lecture questions off of the video screen, so if you have a lecture question, just post it there. It won't go out live and live on YouTube forever and ever, uh, and, but we'll go ahead and address it here. So you can type some questions there. If you have questions, you can also pop your hand up on Zoom and ask them verbally. And again, uh, the only things that recorded are the things that I say, so anything you say won't go onto the internet, uh, and except in your uh, fine influencer-oriented channels. Uh, anyways, um, any questions before we get started? All right, uh, seeing none, let's go. Uh, today I want to tell you a bit about the Gaia uh, satellite mission. Um, this is an introduction to real observational data. Uh, a lot of the things I'm going to be going through at fairly high speed, like magnitudes and parallaxes and radial velocities, we will come back and do formal definitions of next week on Monday and Wednesday. So this is kind of a primer for why do I care about this stuff at all? Uh, then we're going to use this uh, Glue software to visualize a catalog and image data. Uh, we've managed to solve all the problems so far in Glue installs that I know about by uh, a couple things on Windows platforms. Thanks to everybody in Glue Help for kind of troubleshooting that. Uh, I feel like I was pretty useless, but I'm super grateful for you all helping each other. Uh, and then uh, with this Glue software, we can visualize the actual data and see what's in them. And then what we're going to do is going to link images and catalog data together. We'll make an observational HR diagram, and I'll show you this cool trick for finding clusters of stars using proper motion. And we'll come back and understand the physics of all of these later, but this is mostly the method pieces here, and I want to show you some of the results that we have discovered uh, in our uh, field uh, using these techniques. So first, let me tell you about Gaia. Um, Gaia is the Global Astrometric Interferometer for Astrophysics. It's a mission launched by ESA, which is the European Space Agency, back in 2013, uh, almost eight years ago. Uh, and its objective is to measure the locations and motions of one billion stars, which is, you know, a lot. Like, it's about a factor of a thousand times more than the previous mission called Hipparchos, 
uh, generated. So really, this is a monumental step forward, and it's revolutionizing one of the aspects that we teach in this class about galactic astrophysics. It really uh, is such high quality data that it's just very easy for me to bring the data into the classroom just because it's such exceptional quality. Ordinarily, when I teach somebody a bit about observational astrophysics, you sort of put these things in there and you're like, okay, well now if you squint here and you put your hand over those data there and you throw away the part here where the instrument was behaving badly, you can just kind of make a conclusion. But with Gaia data, you just kind of sneeze and results come out. It's amazing. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is the view of Gaia uh, on, the, on the sky. And these are the uh, Gaia from what's called Data Release 2. What this is, is a plot of the stars in Gaia that have been measured. And everyone has been color coded based on the actual color that Gaia observes. So this isn't actually an image. These are all the Gaia sources. And this represents some more than a billion sources on the plane of the sky. Uh, and what you can see here is that this is a view of our galaxy. The center line that you see there is the uh, galactic plane. We live in a thin disk galaxy. Uh, the things off in the lower right-hand side, uh, those two little bright spots, those are satellite galaxies of ours called the Magellanic Clouds. Uh, we'll study more about the Magellanic Clouds later. And then this wispy dark stuff that you see all over is what's called dust. And dust is kind of a bad name for it. I think it's uh, better sort of represented as soot. Uh, which is this sort of amorphous carbon that uh, stars in the late stages of their evolution boil off in, uh, into space. So stars turn out to be somewhat dirty uh, polluters, and this is basically stellar pollution out there. And it leaves us with this amorphous carbon grit all over that gets in the way of our beautiful view of our galaxy. Uh, but it tells us where the interstellar medium is. And if you look at the calendar description of the course, the first thing in there is interstellar medium. So that part of the course is now. We'll, we'll come back and do ISM in a few weeks. But uh, this is the Gaia view of the sky. And for each of these, more than a billion objects, Gaia precisely measures its position on the sky, the brightnesses of each of the objects in three colors. Uh, we'll talk about colors precisely over the next couple days, next couple lectures. Uh, stellar parallax, which you may have heard of. Again, we'll come back to. Proper motions, which you may less likely to have heard of, but again, we'll come back to. And radial velocities. And this is an interesting set of observations because it gives us a lot of information about stars in the galaxy. Uh, a quick introduction here is uh, when we talk about the coordinates here, we're measuring these in a system that is called right ascension and declination. And astronomers operate in this model where we have this thing that's called the celestial sphere. And it's essentially a very distant sphere centered on the Earth uh, on which we project everything and give it angular coordinates in terms of a longitude and latitude-like set of coordinates, and that's right ascension and declination. And the reason why we sort of project it all onto a sphere is things are at different distances. St some stuff is gigaparsecs across the galaxy, uh, some of the stuff is the moon. And we sort of put them all onto the same coordinate system, so we can basically say, where things are in the sky. This is a nice coordinate system for orienting telescopes, but it has some peculiarities buried into it uh, that kind of um, you know mess with us a bit. We need to be aware of it. So this is my poorly drawn celestial sphere. Mwah, I love it. Uh, and the lines of longitude on that celestial sphere are the lines of right ascension. I've labeled it RA in the diagram that you see there. And then those parallel lines that are latitude-like, those are the declination. So much like the lines of longitude on the Earth, uh, lines of right ascension converge at the poles. And just like you can go up to the North Pole and stick your hand on the pole, which totally exists, and then run around it, you can move very quickly through lines of right ascension. But the, and so basically their spacing changes 
Uh, so up at the poles, lines of right ascension are very close to each other, but down at the celestial equator, i.e. declination or latitude equals zero, uh, they're very far apart. So we have to be careful of this effect going forward. The declination is measured usually in units of degrees, and then right ascension can be measured in degrees, the same convention, and it can also be measured in units of time, the crazy convention. Uh, the uh, reason why it's measured in time is that the uh, Earth is rotating under the celestial sphere. Uh, I mean, the Earth turns, newsflash, it's what I learned in college. Anyways, so the Earth is turning with respect to the stars, and it turns around once per day. The aficionados in the audience will note that it's once per sidereal rather than synodic day, uh, but those two values are very close. And so that's why you measure it in units of time, is it makes it very convenient to uh, steer a telescope using a measure of time instead of degrees, but for our purposes, we just need to be fluent in converting between those two. The next thing that Gaia measures is something called the brightness of the star. We can parameterize this in terms of flux uh, units. And uh, what Gaia does is it measures it in three different sections of the visible light band. Uh, we call these affectionately green, blue, and red. Uh, where the green is this black curve that sort of spans everywhere from 400 to about 900 nanometers, and that kind of represents all the light in the visual band. And then the blue and red curves represent sort of blocking filters that only select light in that part of the spectrum to come in. In the blue filter, you get from about 400 to about 650 nanometers which is actually deep into the red. And then the red goes from 650 out to about 1,000 nanometers. So that's really the near infrared. Uh, and then this little orange curve, I think it's orange, I'm deeply colorblind, but this other curve that's labeled RVS is where we look at radio velocities. More on that in a second. The units of brightness that we'll be dealing with are called magnitudes. More on that on Monday, but Magnitudes measure the brightness on a logarithmic scale, and it's backwards. So small numbers equal brighter sources. A little bit confusing, but that's where we're at. The absolute magnitude is a measure of the intrinsic power of the star. So we'll get back to the intrinsic power uh, and how we calculate that in a sec, uh, because we need to know the distance to the star to measure the intrinsic power. And that's from a system that's called parallax. So parallax is uh, the apparent motion of a nearby object with respect to the background stars, and, because, and that motion is induced because of our Earth's orbit around the sun. On one, time, at one part of the year, we're looking up at the object and we see it at a slightly different angle than six months later when we're on the other side of the orbit and it kind of looks at a slightly different direction. And through some fairly... Um, elementary trigonometry, you can relate the distance from the Earth to the Sun and the parallax angle to that distance d that you see labeled in the figure here using this tangent function. And we're often operating in the small angle limit, which allows us to basically approximate the tangent of that small angle as just the angle itself. Big warning sign that I try to plaster everywhere, well, except for here. That uh, air angle measure has to be in radians to use a small angle prop, uh, approximation. The next thing that Gaia measures is this thing that's called the proper motion. And the proper motion is a measure of a star's motion with respect to more distant stars. I don't know if this is actually going to animate. If, oh, hey, yeah, there it goes. Okay, uh, with respect to distance background stars. And so what you see here in the right-hand panel is the proper motion of a star called Barnard star, which is famous for having one of the largest proper motions uh, of any nearby star. And this isn't parallax. It's distinct from parallax. Uh, proper motion actually represents the motion of the star traveling through space, and things that are nearby and moving quickly, like Barnard's star, 
actually are visibly moving with respect to their background objects. Uh, everything else in this uh, picture is actually moving as well, just at much slower angular speeds. It could be farther away and have a large speed, but it would only appear to move a little bit, or it may have a lower intrinsic speed altogether. But the Gaia satellite is also measuring the proper motions of these stars. It's basically measuring the flow of a billion stars as they move through the galaxy. So you can see how this, you can maybe get a sense of how this is going to give us a lot of information about what kind of system we live in. In addition to measuring the motion on the sky, so proper motion is measured with respect to right ascension, and declination, uh, we can also measure the motion of a star towards us and away from us uh, using something called the radial velocity. So that's basically the velocity along a radial vector from the observer out to the star. We measure this using the Doppler shift or the Doppler effect. And uh, so we'll use usually the non-relativistic formula formulation, which you can see sort of summarized in an equation here. And that's where that little band out in the very red part of the spectrum, the near infrared part of the spectrum is used. This is a spectrum of a star from the Gaia data release paper, uh, measuring the brightness, uh, the flux density from that star <coughs> as a function of wavelength. And the lines that you see here are atmospheric lines in the surfaces of this star, HIP 58558. And these are lines from calcium and iron. And by measuring the wavelength of those lines with respect to the observed wavelength, we're actually able to measure how quickly, or sorry, yeah, the observed wavelength with respect to the intrinsic wavelength from quantum mechanics, we can measure how quickly the star is moving towards us and away from us. So, for those of you who are sort of like adding things up here, we have a ton of information. And the reason why Gaia is such a rich data set is from the positions and the parallax, we are able to measure where an object is in three-dimensional space. This is essentially the spherical polar coordinates of a star. We have a radial vector from parallax, and then the two polar angles are just the coordinates on the sky. Then the proper motion and radial velocities give us three dimensions in velocity. And so in terms of kind of a physics mechanics perspective, we know where the star sits in phase space. We have a full six dimensional measure of where all of these objects are. Uh, and so this is really amazing, but you can't measure all of these parameters for all of these objects. Sometimes we'll get 2D, 3D, 5D, or 6D uh, information. This uh, figure shows a bit of a breakdown of the kinds of stars that we have in a data release, uh, in the data release two from Gaia. We have about 1.6 million stars for which we have the where they are on the sky, 1.6 billion with a B. Uh, stars where things are on the sky. We can measure their colors for about 1.3 billion of them and the parallax and proper motion for about 1.3 billion. These are not necessarily all the same complicated Venn diagram. Uh, we can characterize some of the stellar properties like surface temperature and radius and luminosity. Uh, but the thing that you should pay attention to is this tiny little uh, circle down here of radial velocity. That's only 7 million stars compared to 1.6 billion stars. So that's, you know, where kind of the whole 6D analysis breaks down. And so we'll have sections of that as we go through. We are never going to deal with all 1.6 billion stars. Um, that would break your computers. Breaks my computer, so maybe you have a better computer than you have than I do. Um, <clears throat> anyways, so this gives us the appropriate subsets. I see some questions coming in on lecture. Feel free to ask. Like, one thing I like to say is this is all stuff I know, so it's not very useful for me to sit here and tell myself this. It's important, like we're here, and you're paying for the fine privilege of being able to make sure you learn what you need to know. Ah, is there a reason why the red-blue color graph is almost 50-50? Uh, I, I, I'm going to do the professor thing, which is I'm not entirely sure. 
Uh, but I will say that I think that this is basically because if you can measure the color in one band, it's pretty easy to measure it in the other because uh, the big thing is how bright is this star? Only things that are very red or very blue will show up in one band or the other. Uh, the other thing that could happen is if it's slightly off the red chip of the uh, satellite and but have observed in the blue chip that could also give you some differences in the objects so those are my conjectures as to why you get almost this but not exactly the same number uh, there so it's a good question all right so what I'd like to do is use this glue package for us to explore some of the data. So this uh, GlueViz is some software that is developed from uh, uh, the Ast Astronomical Python community. Uh, this is working with a research group that I collaborate with a bit. So it's the kind of thing, if we have a lot of problems, I will email Tom and Alyssa and say, hey, this is broken, let's try to fix this. And maybe we can get this developed for us. It looks flashy, but this is, uh, you know, it's a useful software package uh, for doing the astronomical uh, uh, observations. Oh, Liam points out that we could get slightly more measurements because of interstellar reddening. It is, this is a good point. Um, uh, the observations, uh, stars are intrinsically redder uh, because of the dust uh, along the line of sight. So maybe that accounts for why we have a preference for detecting, slightly detecting more red stars. Um, okay. So, well, uh, glue is really useful for exploring data sets with high dimensionality. And we talked about the 6D uh, here, but we actually have more dimensions we can ascribe to the data because every star comes with many, many measurements associated with it. And so I've asked you to try to install glue. If you can't install glue, anything that's graded in the class, I think I, I'm sort of creating a shadow exercise uh, that can be done with Sheets or Google Sheets or Excel. Uh, and so if that's necessary, we'll make sure that that's accessible. But glue will give you a lot more of the insights that we need here and will be, I think, less of a pain in the patukas. So, uh, if we go and get some data, uh, we can go onto eClass under this observational data link and grab these two uh, files, uh, Pleiades DSS bband.fits and Pleiades results. CSV. And these two are measurements of a nearby stellar system called the Pleiades. And it's two different types of data. And I got these two different types of data because they illustrate how the um, uh, how we can use glue to connect up and uh, view this data set. So the Pleiades uh, is an asterism. So it's a tiny little group of stars on the sky. And if you look to the south when it's not, I'm pointing in the south, that's completely help, not helpful to you. But if you look to the south uh, when it gets dark at like 4 or 3 p.m. or whenever, and it's a clear day, uh, you can see in the constellation Taurus, there's going to be this tiny little bit of stars. And a lot of people with better eyes than mine look at that and say, is that the Little Dipper? And I say, no, the Little Dipper is over there. Now this time pointing to the north. Uh, but it is this tiny little symbol here. Uh, I love to point out that in uh, Japanese, the name for this asterism is Subaru. And if you look on a Subaru car, you see these stars in the logo. So uh, these uh, six or seven bright stars here, turns out there's many more, are also a young stellar cluster. And clusters are fascinating from the perspective of astrophysics because they represent a group of stars that are basically a family or I guess a generation, a bunch of sibling stars that all formed out of the same glob of molecular gas all at the same time. And so the Pleiades uh, and the observations that we're looking at, I'm going to give the image data that's roughly subtended here by this yellow square. And so that's what that uh, image file is. And then we have Gaia data from this same region. So before we get going, uh, I promised you a bit of ePoll, so uh, I'd like for you to log into ePoll and ask you how's your glue experience going so far, if at all. So, uh, yeah, you should have 
uh, some results. So the experience that we have developed uh, using Glue is that if you're on Windows, uh, there were two things that we needed to know. Uh, the first is you need to be uh, you need to run it as an administrator or give it permission to uh, run on your computer. And the other thing is if you pop up and you just get a blank screen, give it some time. Okay, apparently it takes a while for the bits to get past through quarantine to get to your computer. And so giving it some time allowed it to uh, start up. So those were the two tricks that we have found. It would be really great if you have additional issues and it didn't work, go ahead and post them in the um, uh, glue help questions in uh, glue help on Discord and we'll try to troubleshoot them. I really, again, thanks to everybody who really kind of helped out all of this. Uh, looking at the results, it looks like most people got it working, which is fantastic. Um, and nobody uh, thinks Netflix is that amazing. So, all right, uh, we're good. Okay, I'm gonna close down the poll. Uh, da -da -da, and we're done. So we have a few people who are still struggling to get glue working or it didn't work immediately and time took over. Uh, so let's try to troubleshoot that here. You don't need to follow along for what I'm doing, uh, but I hope it's helpful. All right, so we're going to uh, do a little bit of glue use for the rest of uh, the time here. So post questions in either glue help or lecture questions and we'll try to field both of those. I'm just going to give a quick note that what we're doing is we're using two different astronomical data types. We're using a catalog, which is the results from Gaia. I literally made this catalog by sending a, a query to the Gaia archive uh, and got back results and basically dumped those onto you. Uh, this is a catalog is basically a spreadsheet. We'll see that in detail. It has a bunch of properties of stars measured for all of them. In It's in a bunch of rows. Each row is a star. The other thing is an image. Images in astronomy kind of have two parts. They have the image itself, which is basically like an image that you have, like a picture you take on your phone, except instead of like this nice quick CMOS color camera that you have, it uses charged couple devices or CCDs. Uh, and which measure very precisely the amount of light they uh, receive. Uh, and with that comes metadata. And so when we, uh, the, the data is the actual file, and then metadata refers to the information that tells you about the data. So this tells you where it is on the sky, where it, when it was observed, who observed it, um, any things you should be aware of with the data, all that's in the metadata. Your phone camera images also have metadata. So if you tag something with a location, that goes into the picture metadata there. It's kind of the same principle. We use two different formats here. FITS is the Flexible Image Transport System. So something.fits is usually an image file. You can make it so it's not, which is crazy. But uh, anyways, FITS is something developed to be back compatible with uh, Fortran 77 in punch cards in the 1970s. So it looks a little weird. Um, we've come a long way, but we haven't updated our image formats at all. And then you're probably more familiar with CSV files or comma separated values. These are really good for representing some catalogs here. Okay. Um, I'll come back to that, but I'm going to hop on over to uh, the glue. Boop. All right. So here I have a bunch of uh, file. And if you open up glue and you have some data files, you should have this file, these uh, two files downloaded. The results short is a subset of your uh, Gaia data, which will not break a spreadsheet program, uh, you know, because that that's something that can happen. Uh, and to load the files into Glue, you just kind of drag them into Glue. And when I drag the image file into Glue, it puts something up here in this image data set. And then I can also pop the Gaia data into Glue. Boop. And then I don't need this anymore. So. What we do is, uh, if we want to look at the image on the sky, uh, all we do is we grab this file that's named primary, 
and drag it into the canvas. This area here I'll call the canvas. And it'll ask me, how do I want to show this? And I think that this would be a fantastic thing to see as a two-dimensional image. So there I got it. It's a two-dimensional image. And this is the image that I sort of showed you earlier. Uh, so fantastic. You all have visualized an astronomical data set. Um, and I'll call what well, you know type questions if you're seeing any issues coming up uh, but you'll note that these are in coordinates of right ascension and declination right ascensions having units of hours right here uh, declinations measured in degrees and arc minutes uh, right ascension here is in hours and um, uh, minutes not arc minutes and what's neat about this is that like whenever we click on something in glue and kind of highlight it and get this blue border around it what we can do is we can do change parameters like i can uh change the color this is just what we call grayscale data which means the only information that's encoded in it is how much light there is and you can sort of see uh but i can change how that uh intensity is turned into color on the screen by changing what's called the color map so you know you pick something that uh makes you feel pretty happy uh you can change what's called the stretch which is how the values are transformed into brightness this allows you to see faint image faint features and bright features at the same time uh you can change the limits on this which sort of says give me the bright drop the brightest or faintest pixels uh, here so these are just some tools and you can kind of mess around with it to kind of visualize the data as you see fit um, so that gives me a nice astronomical image I'm gonna park my canvas over here behind my talking head and then I'm gonna go back up here and I'm gonna grab the Gaia which is the Pleiades results and in the Pleiades results, oh, I'm going to make sure I don't have any, uh, nope, no Zoom questions either. When I met, bring this over, I'm going to start out by looking at this as a table viewer to just to show you what's actually in the data. So if I open up a table viewer, it gives me this spreadsheet-like view of the data. And if I can scroll down, it goes from row one all the way to row 24,000. There are 24,000 Gaia entries off in this tiny section of the sky. I did download the whole sky. That would have gotten 1.6 billion. Instead, I just grabbed these 24,000 that are kind of pointed towards the Pleiades. And each of these files, oh my gosh, that is not the way to do it, uh, has all of these properties, source ID, MG, whatever those are, thought, G, mean, mag, whatever. Uh, and if I go back, uh, what you're seeing here is the definitions of those columns. We won't need all of them. I'm just sort of putting this up here so you can go back and stare at the video if you need it later. Uh, and what you're seeing is we have things like this absolute magnitude, which is the power associated with each star. Uh, the uh, apparent magnitude, this blue-red color, which is a uh, ratio of the blue to the red light, parallax angle, right ascension declination, lots and lots of observations here. And so we can use these to make a plot. So I've, this is cool, I got a nice table. I'm gonna uh, get rid of the table for now because what I really want is a 2D scatter plot. And then it spits out what can arguably be called a useless uh, plot. So what is plotting is the source ID, which is just a number that the Gaia people give to every star. Every star has a number, and it's some, you know, 10 to the 16 digit, you know, 16 digit number, so they can keep track of their sources. And then over here, we have the absolute magnitude. And I don't really want to plot the source ID and the absolute magnitude. Uh -uh. I want to put the color on the x-axis. So this is BP underscore RP. And if I do that, I get something astrophysically interesting. It's an, this is called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So it's plotting the color of stars versus their luminosity. Except if you've seen an HR diagram, 
you realize kind of looking upside down. And that's because the magnitude axes are reversed because uh, magnitudes that are fainter or magnitudes that are larger numbers are fainter sources. And astronomers like to put the fainter sources on the bottom. So what we do is we hop into the uh, limits button, that's right here, and then I can switch the y-axis by clicking this little arrow arrow button. So whoop, bam, we have made a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And I think this is pretty cool because really all we did was go to the Gaia or you know go to the Gaia archive, chunked out a bunch of the sky, and threw it into a spreadsheet-like program, and we got these results. So I mean, it's pretty cool. So what you can do is uh, you can also uh, do things like color code the um, data points by another uh, value. So you could plot these by, for example, I don't know, parallax. And so then this will give us the values uh, going from you know, 0.27 up to 31. If I make that one, I might get a little bit more of a range uh, here, or yeah, maybe five. You can adjust this. And so this basically makes the uh, dark points have a parallax of five, and then the lighter points down here will have a, oh, sorry, have a parallax that's like 0.27, and then the fainter points have values that are like five. And then you can adjust the opacity of the points if you want to see this. So what this shows you is sort of the structure and where there are more sources, which is kind of useful to see. Most of the sources in the HR diagram are right here. And then it kind of fades off over here going into this direction. So this is really neat. We've got an HR diagram. All right. Uh, and you can sort of see we, uh, I'm going to turn up the brightness here. Um, I'm going to shut off this uh, color point. Uh, you can change this. Uh, oh, sorry, I should talk through what I'm doing. If you go to the points tab, you can plop on here. You can change this to what's called a density map. And this is basically a two-dimensional histogram of where the data are. So you can sort of see uh, that this, eh, I want a linear stretch and uh, sort of turn this up. This again shows you where the data are. And if I adjust this DPI, it kind of changes the binning of that histogram, uh, kind of the resolution. And I use this because it's really important to know where most of the data are. And in these two dimensional plots, things can get kind of crowded. So it's often useful to use this to kind of view these 2D points. So you, if you're doing this at home, are really seeing uh, these points, uh, the real HR diagram. And so what's kind of cool about this, these stars here are what we call the main sequence of stars. And so main sequence, most of the stars are on it. And so we very creatively named them main sequence. There's kind of a long stretch here. And then up here, there really aren't that many stars. This is called the red clump. For those of you in Astro 320, these are helium burning stars in their core. And then this stretch up here is the red giant branch. And the stuff down here, anybody know what the things down here are called? Type it in lecture questions. Mostly because we need some audience participation. Anybody? Anybody? Ah, <gasps> oh, I got some awesome, yes! Oh, I love it. Thank you so much for participating. Sometimes I just love talking to my computer screen, but every now and then it makes me feel a lot better that there are people out there. So thanks. Um, yeah, absolutely right. These are the white dwarfs. Uh, they are down here at, they are very low luminosity and they are over here on the blue side of the colors. I should note that things over here are blue and things over here are red. And one thing that I could do is I could actually color code that. Oh, let's try that. So I can make blue to red and then pick a color map that has blue on one side and red on the other. Boom! Blue to red. Mm, pretty good. So, uh, so there we are. This is a pretty neat way to visualize all our data. Colors, though, uh, not even. Okay, so let's uh, shrink this on up. So I have here two views of the same part of the sky. This is an image that was taken by the Palomar telescopes. Uh, this is all the data collected by Gaia. 
And what we'd like to do is connect these two pieces together. And to do that, here's where glue kind of shows its stuff. We're going to go up here to this button called Link Data. If you click Link Data, this brings up this thing called the Link Editor. And what I want to do is I want to compare Link, the Pleiades results, it's the Gaia data, with the Pleiades DSS B band. So I'm going to click on both of those. And then I need to tell it what parts of those data sets belong together. In the Pleiades results, I'm going to take the right ascension, which is abbreviated RA, and link it to the right ascension here. It's not the smartest program. You got to help it out every now and then. But once you do that, I'm going to say I'm going to glue those things together. And I get a little line here saying these things are glued. And then I also want to connect the deck with the deck. Glue those there. So when I do that, it says, oh, the right ascension in this data set is the RA in this data set. This makes sense. And then what I can do is take the Pleiades results here and throw them over, just grab them from the data viewer and toss them onto the image. And then what you see here is that it just fills all these points and it puts a point everywhere there's a Gaia source. This is let's call this not the best way to see this. So if I want to change the color of that, I click on that and it pops up a little color viewer. And as I said, I'm colorblind. So I like my colors big and bold and yeah, much like my coffee. And if I do that, that changes the colors into these nice bright blue points. So this is really cool. So I can see where the Gaia data sit on this image. And from there, I can sort of uh, zoom in, and what you'll see as I get in here is that all the little dots in this image, not all of them, a lot of them have these little dots on top of them. So maybe whoop, dot, 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 I'm having fun. Okay, uh, what's kind of interesting though is something like this is missing. Ah. So a uh, question came up, what happened after we glued the data? So you, uh, sorry, I went through that quick. You just grab the, res uh, the data from Ple the Pleiades results from Gaia. And all I did was I dragged it into the image. And that basically says, throw this into the same plot and try to show these things together. So that'll put the dots on that. So every dot here is a catalog entry and we can see what the things are talking about. And then, uh, so first off, this is missing. How did Gaia miss that star? And the reason why we're not getting complete coverage is I actually filtered the Gaia data query for things where we have good results. This thing is too bright, can't actually see it. Uh, and so uh, in the Gaia data, because it's basically saturating the detectors. So that leads to some problems in the, um, uh, actual calibration. So we've actually removed that from the data here. We could go and get it. It would be kind of ratty results here. Uh, the other thing that you can do uh, with this, which I think is kind of neat, is you can make selections. And I told you about these red clump stars. If I want to pick out just the red clump stars, I just sort of grab them. I, I click on that little selector up here, this thing. Uh, which makes a circular selection. And I click and I highlight that. And that gives me, if we look over here, this thing called a subset. And that's those points. I can turn that subset on and off and see that I've picked the red clump stars and some stuff around it. And what's neat is that if you pop back over here, you see these are the red clump stars. And so I can go into here and sort of zoom in and see this thing back here in the background. That thing right there is a red clump star. So I got that by kind of connecting up these two data sets. So it's a neat way to explore data that way. Uh oh. Oh no. All right. So I have snuck that window in there. The last thing that I wanted to do, yeah, okay. last thing I wanted to do, oh, if you just want to shut off subsets, you can go ahead and click them on and off in either of the plots. So 
whenever you click on a plot, its controls become active here. So the last thing I wanted to do was to sort of show you an interesting property about uh, stellar clusters. And that is they're moving all through the sky together. They got formed in this gas cloud and they've been going around the galaxy all together. So not only are they born together, they're kind of going through their first stages of their lives together. And to get a sense of that, I'm gonna go in here and grab my Gaia data and I'm gonna pop down, I want a 2D scatter plot again. So I'll pop that in there. Oops, let me shrink this up again because He's trying to be fancy. Can I still get the Ah, sweet. Uh, goodbye, image. I don't think we need you for now. Okay, so I end up with a somewhat useless uh, thing. I'm done with the subset, so I'm going to click on it. I'm going to hit the delete button, which gets rid of it. What I want to do now is make a plot of the proper motion PMRA and PMDEC. So this plots the two proper motions against there, how fast it's moving in the RA direction, like real across the sky, and how fast it's moving in the deck. And this is plotted, I think, in units of milli arc seconds per year. Uh, and so what we'll see here is, you know, things down here are moving on average at, you know, maybe around zero, but between zero and 100 arc seconds per year. So, it's kind of cool, but if we uh, look at this, yeah, there's lots of points there. And here I got to look at those data in terms of density again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of adjust the density here down a bit and kind of change the size of it. And what's neat is, maybe you can see this here, maybe if I make a density plot, it's not just a blob. There's all these stars in the sky that are moving around zero, zero. And then there's this big blob right here that's moving all through the sky together. Its vectors are at 25 and minus 50. So they're basically moving to the left and down in the image all together. They're all going off in that direction. And these are the stars that were formed together. That's the Pleiades. So what I can do is select those. So if I click on that and pull a little blob right there together, that selects the blob. And now let's look at that uh, HR diagram. When you look at this, suddenly this razor thin uh, main sequence emerges. You know, before I did that, this was all kind of fluffy and you're like, oh, observational error or something like that. But no, the observational errors are minuscule in these results. And what you're seeing here is the main sequence for the Pleiades. And it's essentially high quality and unresolved. It's just these stars right along there. So it's really amazing. Oops, what did I do? I gotta give you some flippy flipping. Uh, so this is the... Uh, uh, main sequence for the Pleiades. And this mess here, all of the reasons why this stuff is kind of a fluffy, puffy main sequence is that stars actually evolve while they're on their main sequence. Their sizes and luminosities and temperatures change and they rise up off the main sequence as they evolve. And the Pleiades are razor thin, all moving together. And I can pop those, um, I can sort of see uh, if I pop the image back over here, oh, uh, shoot, where did that go? Uh, anyways, uh, in the shortness of time, I won't show that particular thing because I, you know, screwed it up. What's interesting also is that there are these few stars that aren't on that. There's a couple green points up here. And those, uh, all right, I'll leave that as a conclusion. What are those sources? Any conjectures in the lecture questions channel? So, 
We have a suggestion here that they are the stars leaving the main sequence. That for the main for the Pleiades, that's these stars here. This is the main sequence turnoff uh, up here for the Pleiades, and that allows us to put a very precise age on this. Uh, I'll conclude and just note that these stars are not stars. They are not single stars. These are binary systems. And so these are stars with roughly equal luminosities that are here together and being measured by Gaia as a single source. They're very close together. And so they have about the same temperature and same color, but they have a little extra luminosity because of the binary companion. And so that gives you this binary sequence up here, uh, down right there. So we really just pull out this cluster of stars with exquisite detail. All right, that brings us to the end of today. I went a little long, I'm sorry for that. Uh, I'll stick around for any questions. Otherwise, thank you all very much. Uh, we'll have some glue and Gaia visualization questions on the next homework. So uh, I hope that you get a chance uh, to look at it then. All right, uh, everybody have a great weekend. I'll catch you all later. Bye-bye.